Welcome back. Here we go again. We've got The Comfort Crisis written by Michael Easter. And this is Embrace Discomfort to Reclaim Your Wild, Happy, Healthy Self. So Michael Easter, he's a contributing editor at Men's Magazine, a columnist for The Outside Magazine and professor at the University of uh, Nevada, Las Vegas. So uh, The Comfort Crisis essentially... A quick synopsis is is that modern man has gotten too comfortable. We have too many maybe innovative things that that make our lives super easy. Uh, And a lot of us are employed on computers. And so essentially we spend a lot of time in sedentary environments and don't experience enough of the, you know, harsh climates, physical exercise, hot and cold uh, mental challenges along with all the physical things. And so uh, it's affecting our mental health. It's affecting our physical health, our spiritual health, and even relationships. And so uh, he dives into a lot of those aspects of life and gives data and hard science, as well as a few anecdotal things. He's in this book telling a story of when he went to the Arctic with Donnie Vincent and a guy named William who they, and they went on a, an extended like 30 day caribou hunt up there. And so they, you know, as far as getting out of your comfort zone, this was, this was an extreme one for him. Um, so he has many good insights in, and I'm excited to get into it, but first I want to welcome Ben Payless to the show again. Thanks for joining me, Ben. Thank you, Bronson. Good to, good to be back with you. It's been a half a minute. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. All right, so let's let's jump into the book here. Um I kind of gave the synopsis of the book, but the first thing I highlighted here basically uh it reinforces that. It says none of this sounds anything like my safe comfortable life at home, and that's the point. Most people today rarely step outside their comfort zones. We're living progressively sheltered, sterile, temperature controlled, overfed, under-challenged safety net lives, and it's limiting the degree to which we experience our one wild and precious life as poet Mary Oliver put it. But a radical new body of evidence shows that people are at their best, physically harder, mentally tougher, and spiritually sounder after experiencing the same discomforts our early ancestors were exposed to every day. Scientists are finding that certain discomforts protect us from physical and psychological problems like obesity, heart disease, cancers, diabetes, depression, and anxiety, and even more fundamental issues like feeling a lack of meaning and purpose. So he starts the book, basically saying, I've come across these bodies of evidence. I'm trying to work this into my own life and try something out of my comfort zone. He goes on a hunt with Donnie, who's a kind of a wilderness expert. He's a biologist. He spent many months out in the wilderness, including an extended stint out in the Arctic as a young biologist where he lived with wolves and has done all kinds of crazy stuff. Donnie's a fantastic follow on Instagram. I've seen him on Joe Rogan and things like that. So Donnie's Donnie's also a very fun person to follow and an expert in the wild. So as he prepares for this expedition, he he meets with lots of people. He's trying to exercise in a way that will help him prepare to pack a large animal, backpacking for days at a time and living out in the wild for 30 days with no resources other than what they take in with them. So this is going to be a, a big challenge to continue on this idea that, you know, our comfortable lives are not necessarily making us happy or better people. Uh, in chapter four, 800 faces, he's talking about that. We all sort of have this uh, built in mechanism to identify problems and solve problems, right? That's what helps us progress. So he's talking about a study where they took people and gave them literature or different different variations of this and they had them identify threats and then over time in the study they would decrease the number of threats that were actually in the material but the readers didn't identify fewer threats they just decreased the threshold for what they considered a threat and that's how our life goes as we get more comfortable so i'm jumping in the middle of that but he says As the threatening faces became rare, the study participants began to perceive neutral faces as threatening. When the unethical research proposals became less frequent, people began deeming ambiguous research proposals as unethical. 
He called this prevalence-induced concept change, essentially problem creep. It explains that as we experience fewer problems, we don't become more satisfied. We just lower our threshold for what we consider a problem. We end up with the same number of troubles, except our new problems are progressively more hollow. <laughs> so the more comfort you have, the more conveniences you have, doesn't mean you're just more happy. You just decrease the threshold of what you consider a real problem. And that may be where the Karens come from, right? Like the, we, we have this idea that life is going to be so much better. I'll be happier when I have X, Y, and Z, when I'm rich, when I have this big house, when I have this nice car, but we just actually decrease the threshold for what we actually consider a problem. And we're frust we're equally frustrated with what was once a minor problem is now a big problem. So he goes on this hunt in, of all places, Ely, Nevada. We're there close to Ely, Nevada, which is where my parents have a farm. And I've spent a few hours circling a filled in tractors. Uh, they also, I don't know if you know this, Ben, they played a song I wrote on the radio uh, out there on local radio. And I was interviewed by the, the radio uh, host. It's kind of fun. I did not know that. Lots of, lots of tie-ins <laughs> in this book, for sure. Kind of crazy. Um, so he goes on the hunt in Nevada, an elk hunt with Donnie. That's the closest he's come to, to actually killing an animal. Um, Michael wasn't the hunter. Donnie was, but he decided not to let the arrow fly. The, elk, the bull elk runs away. And, uh, but it was a cool experience. And then it was that, that, that experience that connected the two, and they decided to go to... Alaska together. Now, as he's preparing to go and to kick off some of this book, he mentions a misogi, which I know you really enjoyed, Ben. Do you mind giving us a breakdown of the misogi and where that comes from? Yeah, you bet. So this this is something that uh, that I I really found interesting, um, and, and have definitely related this back to my my life, and especially what I like have liked to do over the last. 10 years or so. So let me, let me just go into Masogi here quickly, and I'll, I'll read a little bit from, from the book that kind of states what it is. And um, so it's a, it's a Japanese term, and it says here that the state of Sumikiri, now, by the way, I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing these correctly or not, but we're, we're just, we're just going to go with it. All right. The state of uh, Sumikiri provided by Masogi is why ancient students of Aikido would immerse themselves in natural bodies of cold water. Waterfall streams or the ocean would wash away their defilements and reconnect them with the universe. More recently, the idea of Masogi has been applied to other forms of using epic challenges in nature to cleanse the defilements of the modern world. Uh, and what this does is that the, the modern Masogis offer a hard brain, body, and spirit reboot. So I, I found this really interesting, right? So this idea of... Um, forcing yourself to go out and doing something really, really difficult to help to rewire or retrain not only your, your body, but also your mind. Um, and, and thought that this was a, a fantastic idea and, and go back into, this is really what I've liked to do over the last 10 years with, with, with hunting, right? Where you're able to go out and be in the wild and challenge yourself and, and do things that are really, really difficult. Now, some of the things that he describes in here, of uh, different ideas that people have had uh, around Masogi, you know, do do tend to be a little bit uh, a little bit extreme. Like um, one, they walked a mile, I, I think it was, or a half a mile underwater, uh, carrying a a thirty pound stone. <laughs> like that's that's a little crazy. But the idea behind it is that uh, you know this this idea has to be hard enough that you would expect to fail like 60% of the time. So if you do succeed, this is something that, uh, you know, really is an achievement and something that you can look back on, you know, in your life throughout the year until you do your next one. So I just, I thought it was a fantastic idea. One more sentence where you left off, he says, they help their practitioners smash previous limits and deliver the mindful centering confidence and competence the Japanese Aikido followers were also seeking, right? So extending your boundaries for where you're confident, when they describe this in the book, they're talking about doing something that's hard enough that it kind of scares you. You're not 
100% sure you can, you know, accomplish the task, but you're pretty certain you can, right? So if you've never run before, a marathon might be that. It's, it's long enough that you go, man, this is a long time to run. I've never run more than five miles, you know, but if you keep on chugging, you'll probably finish, right? Uh, now certain things could take you out of it, heat stroke or dehydration or muscle cramps or something, right? Uh, but it's not too crazy for someone that's a marathoner that might be a hundred miler, you know, carrying a stone underwater, those kind of things are, they're nuts. But in Michael's case, this Arctic hunt, staying out in the Arctic for 30 days is going to be a misogi. So kind of a cool idea and, uh, comes from some Japanese history there throughout this book. He's going back and forth in the chapters between, hunting with Donnie, being in the Arctic and the experiences he's having there. And then science that he's found from various people throughout the world he's connected with over the years. And some of them are in chronological order and some are not. Some are people he met 15 years previous and, and now he's bringing it into the book, things that he's learned or how it applies. In preparing for this hunt, he did a lot of exercising and went to some experts about it. And he's talking about exercising in, in Las Vegas, where he lives, uh, preparing for a, a hunt in the Arctic, which is obviously an opposite climate. But he says, As according to scientists at the University of Oregon, people who exercise in a 100 degree room for 10 days, for example, increased their fitness performance markers significantly more than a group who did the exact same workout in an air conditioned room. The hot exercise caused inexplicable changes to the heart's left ventricle. This can improve the heart's health and efficiency. Hot exercise also activates heat shock proteins and BDNF. The former are inflammation fighters linked to living longer, while the latter is a chemical that promotes the survival and growth of neurons. BDNF might be protective against depression and Alzheimer's, according to the NIH. So that's a good example. He's going to these science articles or journals or scientists that study these things saying like, this is a lesson learned uh, from these scientists. And then here's how you apply it in your life. So uh, exercising in the heat proved to be beneficial and exercise alone decreases all kinds of, you know, health markers, which we're going to get more into some of those later in the book. Now to skip ahead, I'm already in chapter eight here, they fly into the Arctic and they take these little teeny bush planes, which are actually quite a, an experience in itself. But he gets dropped off first and then the plane goes back to get uh, Donnie and William. And so he's sitting there alone and he he had read all these bear stories and stuff from before. So he's he's worried about, you know, a grizzly bear smacking his head off and all this stuff. But he's like, I've never been this alone in my life. He's sitting there in the Arctic not a sound, no phones, no cell phone service, nothing, nothing. He's never been this way before. So he's talking about being alone. He says, it's an interesting paradox. Despite the fact that people today are rarely alone, we are increasingly lonely. The world is closing in on 8 billion people, a big bowl of human soup. People surround us at work, in the grocery store, during our commute, in our neighborhood, even when we are by ourselves, we're often with the people who speak to us through our televisions, podcasts, or text messages. Yet nearly half of Americans say they're lonely, leading the U.S. government to declare that we are facing a loneliness epidemic. Scientists at Brigham Young University found that it doesn't matter how old you are or how much money you have, being lonely increases your risk of dying in the next seven years by 26%. Overall, it can shorten life by 15 years. That's equivalent to smoking half a pack of cigarettes a day. Good relationships are also, according to the, another study conducted over 80 years by researchers at Harvard, a key ingredient to happiness across our, uh, your lifespan. Good relationships beat fortune and fame. I've cited that Harvard article many times in the podcast, but I want to jump backwards for a second into his 150 people uh, where he says at the signing of the D declaration of independence, only 5% of us were urbanites by 1876. That number was still just 25%, but roughly 100 years ago, we tipped to favor city living today. 84% of Americans live in cities and more are moving in. 
It's an odd trend. According to a recent Gallup poll, only 12% of Americans actually want to live in a city. On the other page, he says, some mental health researchers today call our concrete sprawling environments landscapes of despair, but the industrial revolution spurred a great migration into cities with the promise of secure jobs. We haven't turned back since. Yet interestingly enough, money doesn't seem to overcome the rural urban happiness gap. Studies show that even dirt poor people who live in rural China report being happier than infinitely wealthier Chinese city dwellers. The notion that cities depress us is backed by numbers. People who live in cities are 21% more likely to suffer from anxiety and 39% more likely to suffer from depression than people who live in rural areas. I was dying by this statistic. Like we keep moving to cities for good jobs and security, like financial security, right? Ease of entertainment, things like that. But it's not good for us. People are getting depressed and anxious and don't actually want to be there. I mean, I feel this pull myself. I'm from a small town. I live near Salt Lake and it's like a lot of the conveniences don't seem to be worth it to me anymore. I want to just go back to the the rural living where life is very chill and traffic is almost non-existent and you can exit to nature within just minutes, like five minutes, you're up the hill, you know, uh, whereas in the city, even if you go out into nature, you have to park in the giant parking lot with 10,000 other people and walk trails that are ridden with city slickers. You know, it's like, uh, it's a different, it's a different world. Yeah, sure is. And, you know, I, I thought it was pretty interesting too, about the 150, you know, that, uh, our, our human brain is only able, it seems to have, you know, close relationships with around 150 people and anything more than that, uh, it, it starts to overwhelm you. Uh, and I, I definitely find that to be the case, you know, and I, I, I agree exactly with you is that, you know, the more things get populated, the more I, I would like to shrink away from most of that population, you know, and, and, uh, you know, have relationships with a, a good number of people, but really, you know, a handful of people compared to, you know, what happens in most cities. I didn't highlight it, but in that same chapter, it references like a study of happiness across a bunch of cities. I think there was something like 318. I might have the number off, but it's 300 and change. And New York ranked last in happiness <laughs> in those cities. The more rural cities were all the happier ones. And, um, you know, I'm not surprised you're living in these concrete palaces where you go from office building and laptop onto the concrete pathway, down underground to a subway, onto another concrete pathway and up another high rise building to your apartment where it's, you know, teeny little thing where you can look, watch your TV or laptop for entertainment. It's not a healthy lifestyle. And it's, uh, you know, even though there's a lot of entertainment from like a people perspective, theaters, Broadway shows, concerts, etc. I mean, there's everything in New York as far as entertainment. It's difficult to get out into nature. And we're going to get into the, some of the nature stuff later because it's extremely important. So he's just got done saying that loneliness is a problem, but solitude occasionally is a good thing. And he says, a growing field of scientists today think that these solitude seekers were onto something, building the capacity to be alone may be just as important for you as forging good relationships. Skipping down a bit, he says, solitude is something people generally suck at. In a study conducted by a scientist at the University of Virginia, a quarter of women and two thirds of men chose to shock themselves rather than be alone with their thoughts. Imagine that you can either sit here without me in the room, said the researcher, or I'll stand here with you, but you have to press this red button that sends high level of electrical voltage through your veins. And the participants responded with, hmm, why don't you stay put and I'll just zap. So people are so bad at sitting it with their own thoughts in solitude that they would rather shock themselves and have company than spend a little time alone. Uh, he says, but there are a lot of great pressures you can get out of the experience of being alone with yourself, says Boker. In solitude, you can find the unfiltered version of you. People often have breakthroughs where they tap into how they truly feel about a topic and come to some new understanding about themselves. Building the capacity to be alone probably makes your interactions with others richer. 
Research backs Solitude's healthy properties. It's been shown to improve productivity, creativity, empathy, and happiness, and decrease self-consciousness. Kind of interesting. We're so full of anxiety. We're so worried about being alone. It's like other people's perspective of us is causing us anxiety, but being alone will help us understand who we actually want to be. It's this big dichotomy that people struggle with. Kind of interesting. I'll say one other thing on that too, and I'll go go back to the book for it. Um, you know, he's talking a lot, a lot about uh, uh, your, your mind being focused compared to unfocused. And then here he says, time in unfocused mode is critical to getting shit done. Tap into creativity process, complicated information, and more. So, I, I mean, it goes right along with that, right? Where if we're plugged in all the time, well, our, our brain never has time to, to, to rest and, and reflect, and that's what it really takes to get stuff done. Um, and that's, that's pretty interesting stuff. And, you know, with the advent of, of social media and the time that people spent, you know, whether it's online or in front of a computer, in front of the TV, all the above, um, you know, another part in here, it says the way, the way we deal with it now, it's like junk food for your mind. And that's exactly what it is. And I find myself doing it too. I mean, I'm not exempt, right, to getting on, on, on Twitter and, you know, all of a sudden, 45 minutes later, I'm still on Twitter and now I'm really agitated by something as well. <laughs> so it is, it's just, it's, it's junk food for, for our mind and, and we're never, never allowing our minds time to actually uh, rest, you know, and, and, and do something besides thinking about everything that's going on in the world, wherever, wherever it is. Right. I'm glad you kind of tied the solitude to the boredom because those are two things that I sort of tied together too, even though they're a couple chapters apart. But he does say that, that thanks to technology, I, I rarely let my mind wander. I always have a phone, TV, computer, or other digital device to attend to. The average American each day touches his phone 2,617 times and spends two hours and 30 minutes staring at the small screen. If that seems gross, the study also identified a large group of heavy users who spent more than four hours a day on their phones. In a course I teach as a professor at the University of Nevada, I have students check their phone screen time data. One student averaged seven hours and 44 minutes a day. Another racked up eight hours, 32 minutes. Why, I asked? Because YouTube, the students replied. So I think the younger generations are actually using their phones for more entertainment than the older generations. But he later says that, that most people spend more than twice as much time watching TV than they do on their phones. So either way, whichever way you lean, as far as your media and choice of entertainment, most people are spending several hours a day plugged in, never letting their mind be bored, never really being alone in solitude. It's just, we're constantly distracting ourselves with, with easy entertainment that has true problems actually associated with it. And I'll just, I'll, I'll throw this out there now. So I've actually been on this exact same hunt that, uh, that, that Michael describes. Um, so the exact same one where, you know, flew to Anchorage, went from Anchorage to, to, to Kotzebue, you know, this, this little Eskimo village, uh, sitting there on literally the edge of the world inside the Arctic Circle, uh, and then getting on a little bush plane and, and flying north up further in the Arctic Circle to go uh, to go caribou hunting, um, and and kind of had the exact same um, realizations that that he did. Number one, I was excited to go up there because no one could reach me by the phone or by internet or or, or anything, so it was truly a way to get away. Um, but also kind of the same thing where um, as as I was up there and we were coming back. You know the the bush pilot came to pick us up, and he was able to load up all of our meat that we'd gotten, plus plus my dad who I went with, and and took off, and they flew back to Kotzebue, you know, from being back, at, well, from being out there in the bush, and so then I was left there for about you know two and a half three hours, you know, completely by myself, knowing that there's not another human being, you know, probably within seventy miles of where I was, and it's fantastic. And what he describes in the book uh, about that uh, about that situation and about how quiet it actually is and the things that you can hear, like you can actually hear your own heartbeat, right, or or hear the blood move through, you know, your carotid artery. No, that's true. <laughs> if the wind got quiet enough, you you could actually hear that. 
So that that type of solitude um, and, 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 and disconnection, I think, is a lot of things. Well, is something that a lot of people never get the chance to do, and they really miss out by not having that opportunity because it's, it's pretty phenomenal. Pretty wild. That's a cool hunt to go on, man. I want to go there someday. Though it does come up, come with its uh, downside. The chapter I skipped is he, called 75 Miles, and basically he's describing the first night out there, the wind picks up to near 75 miles an hour, and they're in a teepee that could blow to russia if it caught wind i mean it's it's a wild time and they had to hurry and move their camp to the other side of the the peak so that the wind would be a little bit uh broken by the mountain there but uh pretty crazy man that's a that's a quite the adventure so back to the boredom thing i wanted to just add a a little bit more he's got some interesting insights here he says Boredom is indeed dead, and one scientist way up north in Ontario, Canada, is is discovering that this is bad, a type of bad that's infected us all. He believes that our collective lack of boredom is not only burning us out and leading to some ill mental health effects, but also muting what boredom is trying to tell us about our mind, emotions, ideas, wants, and needs. He goes on to talk to another guy. He says, picture a roadie for ACDC. Now put him in a Canadian neuroscience lab. Congrats. You have James Dackert, a long-haired Aussie who's been studying the human brain on boredom at the University of Waterloo for nearly two decades. I'm skipping a bunch, but he says, sure, it doesn't feel great. Boredom is neither good nor bad, he said. How you respond to it is what can make it good or bad. The man knows this because he's been inside the human mind searching for what areas of the brain are at work when a person is feeling the discomfort of boredom. He recruited some volunteers and put them into a neuroimaging scanner. Then we induced those people into a mood of being bored, he said. We had them watch two guys hanging laundry for eight minutes. And yeah, it succeeds in making people bored shitless. Then Danker uh, looked at the neuroimages of the bored people. He found that their insular cortex had deactivated. That part of the brain is important for processing information that you think is relevant for your goals right now. So it's down-regulated because there's nothing in that video that is important to your goals. Tolsty has this great quote in Anna Karenina that says, Boredom is a desire for desires, said Dan Kurt. So boredom is a motivational state. In the study, Dan Kurt also shows that in what direction the brain goes when you're doing a whole lot of nothing. When the participants were bored, a part of their brain called the default mode network fired on. It's a network of brain regions that activates when we're unfocused, when our mind is off and wandering. Default mode network is an annoyingly dense term for simplicity's sake. I'll call it unfocused mode. Our brains essentially have two modes, focused and unfocused. Focused mode is a mind at attention. It's on when we're processing outside information, completing a task, checking our cell phone, watching TV, listening to a podcast, having a conversation or anything else that requires us to attend to the outside world. Unfocused mode occurs when we're not paying attention. It's inward mind wandering, a rest state that restores and rebuilds the resources needed to work better and more efficiently in the focused state. Time in unfocused mode is critical to get shit done, tap into creativity, process complicated information, and more. When we kill boredom by burying our minds in a a phone, TV, or computer, our brain is putting forth a shocking amount of effort, like trying to do rep after rep after rep of an exercise. Our attention eventually tires when we overwork it. Modern life overworks the hell out of our brains. Our collective lack of boredom may be causing us to reach near crisis levels of mental fatigue, Research shows that the onslaught of screen-based media has created Americans who are increasingly picky, impatient, distracted, and demanding. As one media analyst put it, these terms fall under the umbrella of insufferable. Any overworked, under-maintained minds are linked to depression, life dissatisfaction, the perception that life goes by quicker and increasingly missing the beauty of life that only presents itself when we allow our mind to wander and be aware of something other than a screen. It was a lot of reading, but boredom happens to be extremely important for your mental health, your physical health, your ability to be creative, your ability to think outside the box your satisfaction with life. It's quite impressive. And and, and I'll say, you know, the ability to quiet your mind is, is just extremely important for creativity. 
you know, when you think about if you have a, a thousand things going on in your brain and, and then trying to come up, you know, with either a, a, a good idea or focus on a project for work, for work uh, it's so extremely difficult to do that. Um, and, and it's, it, it becomes so much better uh, if you're able to find a way to quiet your brain down, remove distractions, um, give yourself a few minutes to really delve into a, a problem or a situation or, or to be creative and then start to come up with some ideas to be able to solve whatever that problem is. Um, it, it just doesn't work well when you have a thousand things going through your head. And that's exactly what, you know, the devices and social media and everything does. Um, it, it just puts so many things through your brain. It's, it's very difficult to concentrate on any one thing. It exhausts your focused brain to the point where you can no longer focus well. You're not effective. He says the effects of our overstimulated, stress-averse society are mounting. More than half of adults said they were under high stress in 2017. Anxiety grew by 39% in a recent one-year period. Attention spans fell by 33% from 2000 to 2015. Depression diagnoses are up 33% since 2013. Man, for a life that's getting easier, more convenient, much wealthier, sure seems problematic, doesn't it? It, it does. I mean, we 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 tend to be uh, a lot more unhappy, unhealthy, and and I think there's some reasons that we put forward as to or that Michael puts forward as well as to why. When we do books like this, or what I, where I when I think this through, I often think of Teddy Roosevelt. Um, you know, and and Teddy Roosevelt said that you know man needs wilderness. And, and I think that is so true. You need a place to be able to go get away from, from mankind and be able to disconnect, you know, to get back to your true self, to quiet everything down and to understand who you are. And the email I just sent out, uh, talked about contrast, needing contrast in life and that, you know, our life is just consistently getting easier. I mean, I mean, every innovation at this point, not everyone, but most innovations are simply to Make something that was already easy, easier. And the example I gave was, I mean, we don't even have to walk around the grocery store anymore. We can just click some buttons and they'll either put it in our car for us with car side pickup or even bring it to our house. I mean, decades ago, before refrigeration and good preservation of food, I mean, they really had to work for their food. And if they had extra, they had to really try hard to preserve it, which was only minimally successful. And these conveniences don't seem to be making us happier. So wh how do we how do we find ways to both enjoy the conveniences that we have and take part in the things that are giving us real perspective and uh, mental relaxation and physical health and things like that, which I guess is a good plug for everybody that hasn't signed up for the email list. Jump on there, subscribe so that you can be a part of what we're doing with the book club and with the coming C10 network and any announcements that we have, but also key insights that are not on the podcast and, and Instagram. Yeah, for sure. So, so I think Bronson, you know, what it comes down to is how do we find balance? How do you find balance in life between all the modern conveniences and, you know, going out and uh, being able to, to, disconnect. And I think that's the same with everything in our lives. How do you find balance in everything? You know, whether it be work-life balance or, you know, self versus family, how do you find that balance in, in everything? Because there has to be some, uh, in order for all of us to be happy. I think that's an interesting way to put it, right? The seesaw, like you'll appreciate a comfortable house and temperature co controlled climate much more if you've had some hard days out in the weather, physically demanding and inconvenient climates, right? Cold or hot. You'll enjoy relaxation and watching TV more if you've had a hard physical workout or uh, some challenge, some misogi, right? Something that, that is the exact opposite. You cannot have great perspective without a lot of contrast. Yeah, for sure. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this, Bronson. One of the best beers I ever had. I've had some good beers in my life, but one of the best beers I've ever had in my life was after we flew back from from Kotzebue after being out there uh, in the in the tundra in the Arctic Circle for ten days, flying back, uh, getting to the hotel, throwing our stuff in, and then going over to a restaurant and 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 the waitress putting a 
ice cold 24 ounce beer in front of me. And I drank that thing almost without taking a breath. It was phenomenal. So, and that's it, <laughs> you know, and that's it. After being out, out in the, uh, out of the outdoors and the snow and sleet and rain and wind, you know, with nothing around and, you know, eating, uh, a couple MREs and some caribou meat, but which by the way, I'll say this, he talks about how good caribou meat is. It, no, it's not, it's disgusting. It was literally the worst, some of the worst meat I've ever had. And, and I, I felt a little bad about it because I was hoping it was going to be great, but it wasn't. But anyway, after going through all that, coming back to a little bit of creature comfort, well, then you really do uh, appreciate it. But you've been able to help reset your mind beforehand, you know, and then coming back to that, it it, it does seem much better and would help to get rid of the, the whole Karen phenomena that we see. And not being an alcohol drinker and the fact that beer smells like piss, that had to be <laughs> really bad to come home and go, damn, this beer tastes good. You know? So anyway, I mean. I'll, 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 I'll quote our Supreme, one of the Supreme Court justices, I love beer. So what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm surprised after all these podcast episodes that you haven't decided to give up beer, despite the fact that you like it, because like literally every health book I read says alcohol is killing you. It's making your brain dumber. It's destroying your heart. It's like, it's just not good. All of that is true, but we'll go back to what I said a few minutes ago, <laughs> balance and moderation. Everything is possible and fantastic. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good, my friend. Um, all right. So there's a section on silence, which we've already kind of hit on, but they actually go into quite deep detail on what silence can do for you. And that for each decibel level, like there's, there's that you have in your life and your surroundings, like it has consequences, which are interesting. So he says, other research shows anti-anxiety medication use rises a relative 28% for every 10 decibel increase a neighborhood experiences. And people who live near loud roads are 25% more likely to be depressed. Other studies show that background noise also impairs our att attention, memory, learning, and interaction with others. And the thing is, we don't even realize the noise is dragging us down, according to scientists at Cornell. They had two groups of office workers complete a project. One group worked in a quiet office. The other worked in an open concept office. That open concept office was 50% louder thanks to the annoyances of ringing phones, the clacks of fingers hitting keyboards, people talking about bottom lines, etc. The workers in the loud office said they, had, they didn't feel any more stressed than the workers in the quiet office, but the data said otherwise. Their bodies pumped out significantly more of the stress hormone adrenaline, and they completed less work. They were also less motivated to work, which I find interesting because I've always hated the open office concept. My last job had that, and I was just constantly bothered by it. The fact that they uh, clearly can see the stressors going up in people and anxiety medications and things like that uh, for louder neighborhoods, I thought that was pretty wild. And they go into more detail on where there actually is true silence. They actually have silence chambers where you can go in there and literally be in absolute silence from the outside world. But you mentioned before, you can hear your heartbeat or your breath or things like that. But people come out of there thinking their brain has never functioned so well in their life after spending you know some time in these silence chambers. You know, for anyone who's had children, you know, which is probably a lot of us that are listening to this, to this podcast after spending, you know, a, a weekend uh, alone with your children, you know, you know how golden silence can be. Ooh, so good. So good. <laughs> <laughs> so it good. rarely comes. <laughs> the next chapter is on 4,000 calories. Basically he's talking about nutrition. Now out in this Arctic hunt, they took the minimum amount of food they needed, and it's mostly in the form of like calorie packed bars and stuff like that. Um, but being out there and experiencing actual true hunger is something that most Americans don't ever feel. 
We eat out of convenience. We eat for stress. We eat for feel-good hormones. We eat for culture, all these things. But we have such access to so many varieties of food now. We just eat because we want to eat. Eating's a hobby. So he gets talking about some of these nutritional impacts uh, on humans. And, and this is very, very interesting, I thought. So he says, food insecurity defined as not having reliable access to food is a problem in America, particularly among children who must rely on others to eat. But the much larger problem seems to be an epidemic of too many of us never feeling hungry. As I noted in chapter three, more than 70% of the country is overweight or obese, a figure that's projected to be 86.2% by 2030. And obesity takes an average of five to 20 years off a person's life, according to a study in JAMA, J-A-M-A. Isn't that crazy? Like we have a bigger problem with overeating than undereating in America because we've gone so far in the other direction. We've become so good at producing cheap food and preserving it that we can just eat anytime, any kind of food. And it's killing us. He says, a handful of years ago, I stumbled upon an unexpected new voice in the nutrition space. I love the story of this guy. He says, I first heard about him like you might, an underground fight club. And he was described to me as the outsider insider. I was reporting on a complex health story and had struck out on finding a satisfying answer to a question about the health effects of processed food. After too many futile phone calls, a PhD source passed along his name, Trevor Cashy. And a nondescript email address. This kid will probably give you an, a good answer, he said. He understands the science at a very deep level, but he stands outside of it. He hasn't been incorporated into the machine in a, the way a lot of nutrition experts are who can't see out of it. So he kind of was this bit of a savant, I guess. I mean, at a young age, he was obsessed with nutrition. He has a very, very high IQ. And he graduated with a bachelor's degree before high school and then got his PhD at like age 23. And he's just been really, really dedicated to this science for a long time. So Kashi basically uh, helped him understand that discomfort is inherent to physical change, whether losing weight or fueling an athletic goal and innovative guidance to help people win the inner game of hunger. So basically becoming comfortable with discomfort is how people achieve any goal, right? And it's no different for nutrition. So the feelings of hunger is that's that can be okay. That's all right. You don't have to always eat. Kashi approached a person's nutrition just like he would any other scientific exp experiment by gathering data. Each person tracked and reported how much and what they ate. This involved weighing all the food, their typical daily routine, their sleep schedule, their stress and energy levels, their daily weight, their workouts and step counts. I quickly solved hundreds of problems just by virtue of improving a person's awareness of their own behavior, he said. Further down, he says, research consistently shows people are awful at estimating portion sizes, particularly people who have struggled with their weight. Researchers associated with the Mayo Clinic recently testified that our recall of what we ate bears little relation to what we actually ate. But overweight people's miscalculations are on average 300% greater than thin people's. One analysis discovered that people who are at a healthy weight underestimated their daily calorie intake by 281 calories, while obese people underestimated by 717, the equivalent of a Taco Bell combo meal. A now famous 1992 study of overweight people who claimed to be unable to lose weight despite being utterly convinced that they were eating just 1,000 calories a day discovered via precise measurements that those people actually consumed double that, which is like saying, oops, I ate half a pizza and forgot. <laughs> I found that so fascinating. Like they go on to describe that obesity is not all that connected to genetics. Like there may be a few markers that that cause people to gain and retain weight more than some thin people. But those genes are only expressed when people come up against overeating, right? And that obese people grossly miscalculate their calorie consumption compared to thin people, but that all people tend to overestimate or underestimate, I should say. It's funny. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and one of the, one of the other main things that I got out of this is, you know, and something you said a minute ago is finding a way to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. 
Uh, and that's, that's so true in so many different aspects of our life is that I, I think, I think to be successful in life as a whole, that's what you have to deal with. You got to find a way to be comfortable at being uncomfortable in all sorts of different situations. You know, and it goes with, if you want to lose weight, well, it's going to be a little bit uncomfortable and that's okay. Um, you know what, if you want to go out and do something difficult, you're going to be uncomfortable and that's all right. You know, if you want to go out in the woods where well, you're going to be a little bit uncomfortable because it's going to be too hot or it's going to be too cold or it's going to be too wet or, or heck, too sunny. And some way it's going to make you a little bit uncomfortable and that's all right. Same thing with work. You've got to find a ways to put yourself in different situations that make you uncomfortable so you can grow your comfort level around that and, and so you can learn to deal with that. Um, but going back to nutrition, yeah, that's 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 definitely the case. It's it, It's okay to be a little bit hungry. It's okay to do some fasting. You know, it's okay to, you know, cut off maybe what you're eating at, you know, seven o'clock at night. So you have that 12 to 16 hours of, uh, of fasting uh, that will help improve some health benefits for you going forward. You think of like a superior athlete, it's not comfortable to work out all the time. Like, have you ever watched the Usain Bolt documentaries where he's just like, I'm out there dying, like day in and day out dying. And it shows him laying on the the track just huffing and puffing and sweating so bad and stuff. And, uh, or like Michael Phelps says he didn't miss a single workout for like five years straight, 365 days a year. Like that's not comfortable. That sucks. But they achieved that because they're willing to get uncomfortable and, and deal with it in some other way. Right. But when it comes to food, we're like, Ooh, I'm hungry. I better just, satisfy that itch, you know? And that's, that's one lady's story in here. Basically she says she lost 150 pounds by following this, but, uh, here it is. He says, he taught me that it's okay to be hungry. My response was what he told me to be embrace the suck now. Yeah. I'm hungry. Sometimes it is what it is. I'm okay with being uncomfortable. Now I remind myself that I'm safe, have food and we'll eat when it's time to eat. Interesting, right? Change your attitude. It is. And I love that saying, embrace the suck because some things are going to suck and you just got to embrace it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's the truth, man. It's the truth. And it's like, how big are your goals and what are your goals, right? If your goal is not to get thin, you're just not going to embrace the suck. But if you truly want to be fit and healthy and thin and whatever, uh, you know, you're going to embrace the suck when it comes to, to food, right? So just below that, I got to read this. I had a I had to highlight it. it says people who are at a consistently healthy weight don't have better genetics or a higher metabolism and they don't magically burn more calories. He said, they're just more likely to deal with stress by like going for a walk instead of eating. That's really the difference. More research has backed up this claim, finding that uncomfortable factors like me metabolic dysfunction are exceedingly rare. So the takeaway, right, is when you're feeling stressed, deal with it in an negative calorie way, go for a walk, go to the gym, you know, go out with a friend, do go dancing something, but don't turn to food, right? That's the easy one. And it obviously creates happy hormones. Like we love to eat because it, it hits dom dopamine release satisfaction from the, the false hunger we're feeling, whatever, but consciously make that decision to say, listen, I, I'm stressed from work or uh, there's a story of a guy that rewarded himself every Friday night by binging, right? He'd get home early. He was home alone for a few hours. He'd dive into the like goodies or whatever. But that extra calories adds up over time. And if you do that every Friday, well, a month, two months, three months, years, right? Three years go by. Now you've eaten like several thousand calories too much for, for a few years. and it's going to amount to several pounds of weight and that is not good. Right. And so cope with your stress or whatever it is in a healthy way by going for a walk. So now that we get into exercise, because uh, we just talked about nutrition, he says a study funded by the UK's ministry of defense discovered that people who engaged in a mentally demanding task while exercising increased their time to exhaustion a relative 300% more compared to a group who zoned out while doing the exact same 12 week exercise program. I did not know that. And I found that extremely fascinating. If you're mentally engaged in some complex task while you exercise, you don't feel exhausted as early. 
So next page or two pages later, he says, sometime in the mid 90s, a new idea eventually occurred to Timothy Noakes, MD, PhD, director of the Exercise Science and Sports Medicine Research Unit at the University of Cape Town. He thought that because we activate muscles by way of our brain, our brain must also be responsible for determining how long, hard, and fast we push ourselves. He called the idea the central governor theory and began conducting research. Over three decades, he's shown that exercise-induced fatigue is predominantly a protective emotion. It's a psychological state that has little to do with a person's physical limits. Isn't that crazy? I mean, that's what Goggins is always talking about, right? You think you hit your limit, but you're not actually anywhere close to your limit. It's an emotional state of being that you've convinced yourself, like, we should slow down and conserve some calories. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean, I'll go. Uh, I, I I do this a lot. You know, when I think about okay, you, you spend time in the gym, you're lifting weights. You know, you go to fatigue, right? And so you figure you're fatigued, you're done. On the other hand, you go out caribou hunting out in the Arctic Circle, and you've got to carry back uh, a, a, this this caribou back to your camp. And, and I'll use my situation, but I, I, honestly, it's the exact same as as his because I think it would be the same as anyone's in that situation. Um, you know, you pack up 100 to 125 pounds of meat plus your pack, you know, so you're looking at 130 to 140 pounds, period. And you're walking through this, what I always considered like it's walking on a waterbed where the, the, the ground is moving and mm -hmm. undulating. And there's these tufts of, of grass that if you step on, you're going to roll your ankle. So it's difficult to walk on. But you go out and you do that. For myself, it was four miles one way, right? And then we'd have to put the meat down and go walk the other four miles to get another 125 pounds of meat and then walk it back. And we had to do that six different times, right? So if I'm in the gym, do you think I'm going to carry 125 pounds on my back on a treadmill, you know, for 16 to 20 miles? Hell no. I'm going to say that it's good enough by mile four, right? I had a good workout. It's good enough. But your body is capable of so much more, which is exactly what Goggins says in, in his book and what he always preaches, is that uh, your body is strong, your mind is weak. Your body is capable <laughs> of so much more than you would ever think it is if you go out and put yourself in that situation to actually try and do it. That's an awesome story. And true, like you set the parameters based on the necessity of your environment, right? I work from a computer. So when I go to the gym, it's easy to call it quits and say, you know what? I got a good heart rate increase, pump these muscles. Let's go sit in my desk versus if I don't get this pack back to camp by dark, I'm really going to be hating life. Right. Uh, and your mindset's in a whole different world. You don't want that grizzly to come and slap your yeah. head off. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Moving on, so some of the health benefits they've found. He says, research from the National Cancer Institute and John Hopkins suggests that the more a person marinates in exercise-induced discomfort, the more death-resistant they'll be. A massive study discovered that for every small increase in fitness, a person's risk of keeling over drops by 15%. There is, in fact, no such thing as too much exercise. The John Hopkins scientists found that people who exercise more than three to five times the amount the government recommends were radically less likely to die. That's between 450 and 750 minutes or seven and 12 hours a week. Not interesting. You hear people want, like worry about, oh, you only got so many heartbeats. And if you run too many marathons, you're going to kill yourself. But statistically, you're less likely to die for, for every minute you're exercising. Uh, later on, movement also beats some medications. According to research published in the New England Journal of Medicine, the scientists took a group of people who were about to develop type 2 diabetes. One group received metformin, the most common drug used to prevent delay and treats diabetes. Another group uh, exercised just 15 minutes per day. I was a consultant for the physical activity intervention arm of the study. I remember being very disappointed, said Wendy Court, PhD, a researcher with the NIH who was involved in the study. I thought the bar had been set too low for the level of exercise. The scientists followed up three years later. The exercise intervention was not only as effective, it was more effective, said Court. The pill poppers reduced their incidence of diabetes by 31%. Not bad, except when compared to the exercise group, they dropped their diabetes in incidence by 58%. 
exercise was nearly twice as effective. So I think that's the study that showed the potential therapeutic benefit of doing things that don't involve taking pills, she said. Pretty amazing. Just 15 minutes, which is like nothing. Anyway, that's it for me. Any parting thoughts, Ben? Um, you know, parting thoughts on, on this book is that uh, I, I really in, enjoyed it. Um, I really enjoyed, you know, his story. I enjoyed how he related it back to, to science um, with, with each and everything that he talked about. Um, and, and it just, the entire thing that he brought forth struck me as, as, as being, you know, something not only that could help me out, but something that I already found to be true. Um, is that, you know, if you can, if you can get out and make yourself a little bit uncomfortable, your life is a lot better. Um, and and I, for one, really enjoy getting out into the outdoors and doing those types of things. And, And it helps me understand a little bit better why I enjoy that so much, you know, which was really, really interesting. Um, not only for the fact that maybe it'll help me talk my wife into me going back up to, you know, caribou hunting in the Arctic Circle at some point. You know, it's something I have to do. I need to do it. <laughs> so I'm looking forward right. to that. It's important for yeah. your health. Yeah, but... Uh, You'll be a much better husband. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, but I, I, I'll say Michael Easter um, wrote a hell of a book, uh, really in, enjoyed it, and uh, was, was glad to see, you know, somebody from the Intermountain West r- write, a, write a heck of a book. So go UNLV, go Rebels. <laughs> go Rebels. I agree, man. This was this was really interesting. It was fun that he, the way he described the hunt and the the majestic scenes with the caribou and the mountains and the bears and different things. And, um, that his discomfort, uh, that in his discomfort, he found a lot of things out about himself, but also, uh, just appreciated so many simple things in life that we don't think about when we're constantly distracted. So, um, very well-written book. It's got some dramatics in it. It's got the nature thing. It's got the science. It's, it was, um, it was very fun. So I, I appreciate it as well. This is one that I would recommend purchasing and reading yourself. Uh, I don't say that for every book, but this one, I, I really enjoyed it and thought it had a lot of good takeaways that you can go implement into your life. So this is the comfort crisis. Embrace discomfort to reclaim your wild, happy, healthy self by Michael Easter. We'll put a link in the show notes so you can purchase from Amazon. Appreciate you guys listening. We'll catch you on the next one.